Hello, this is Jim Mizzle, creator of the Zigzag Resource Pack for Bedrock and Java editions of Minecraft. I was working my way through the Caves and Cliffs update when I realized it was kind of time for an updated tutorial of how I texture my entities, since a lot has changed since the last time I posted a video on it. The tools I'll use in this video are Photoshop for the general image editing and painting, I use Lazy Nazumi Pro. It's a brush stabilizer. I'll pop a link in the description. Uh, block bench, and I work with a Wacom Cintiq. Though mine is like 11 years old, and it has a dead bug that crawled up under the glass and died right in the middle. So, first step, you're going to want to grab the default version of the Minecraft resource pack, which you can find on the official Minecraft website. It's going to give you the proper file structure, the naming conventions, as well as the entity models. It's kind of important to note, this is the Bedrock Edition, so it will not work with Java. This file structure is only for Bedrock. I actually just use it to get the entity models themselves into Blockbench, since Blockbench uses this format. And this is a great way to preview your textures on something in 3D. Speaking of Blockbench, you're going to want to install Blockbench. It's a totally rad program that you can make models and textures in, animations, and it also happens to be an amazing previewing tool because as you're texturing in Photoshop, you can be saving over the file and seeing the live results in 3D. While you're at it, go give Janice, the creator of Blockbench, a follow. Smash that follow! Once you fire up Blockbench, you navigate to the Entity Models folder and load the entity you want to work on. And then you'll have yourself a nice little 3D preview of the model as well as the default textures. Um, in the case of this tutorial, I'm going to be doing the Axolotl and there's a few variants, so I loaded them all in. This next step I recommend only if you are making an HD pack. If it's a low enough res, you don't really need to have a ton of guides for yourself because you, you could literally count the pixels from one end to another. But as you start getting into like 128, 512, it's really hard to count out 512 pixels. So I sort of make myself guides just because I work in a higher res pack. So to start creating the guides, I will take a random color, assign them to the front, side, back, top, all the different planes of the models, just using like a big bucket tool to do large fills. Um, this is just so I can see uh, what side is what. Like, I, I don't care what colors I'm using as long as they're different enough that on the line where they meet, I can tell that they are a different plane. Um, it's just a way that I'll be able to see at a glance, this is the front of the model, this is the top of the model, once I go into the 2D view. So for some of the details, I might go in and do a new color. So in the case of this model, the face, if I filled it all in red, I wouldn't know where the eyes or the mouth were on the original. So I'll fill those in in white just so I can remember where they are when I go to paint my own eyes and mouth, which usually I very loosely stick to because the eyes on my characters are pretty googly. As resource pack artists, we're basically reverse engineering the things that Mojang have already created. Um, they already made the model, they already unwrapped it and decided where everything should go, and now we just need to figure out where they put those things. It's about making yourself a clear template so that you know how everything lines up when you go to paint the details. Another cool feature of Blockbench, you can turn off and on elements to see the areas that are hidden. You'll see here I'm turning things off so that I can hit the back faces or the undersides. Um, that's just a nice feature when you're previewing your textures to be able to just turn off and on certain parts of the model. Look at this crazy baby! Once you're ready and all the faces have their appropriately gaudy, crazy colors, you save out your template, open it up in your editor of choice, in my case it's Photoshop, and then I start to pull guides at the borders of every color, and that gives me a selection snap so that I can easily select different areas. So every place that I pop a guide, I can set my selection tool to snap to. I usually lay it in when the texture is small still. Um, that way it's just easier to position. 
Then I resize it to HD and I sort of double check to do last minute nudging. Sometimes it'll be off by just like a pixel or a half a pixel. And again, really only for HD packs. Um, it's kind of that level of detail when you start getting into like, it's a 512 because it's an entity. You'll get like this blurriness or a bleed of pixels over the edges if you don't kind of keep this sharp. And I just kind of like to keep it sharp no matter what resolution it is. So I find having these templates saved out for me is just super useful. Um, you can take it or leave it. You know, if you like to just kind of work with a rough estimate or using the default texture underneath it is enough of a guide. I just find it helps. The last step in sort of getting the template itself ready is I'll import the resized default textures. Um, when you're up resing them from the little itty bitties, you want to make sure that you set it to nearest neighbor um, and that keeps them crisp. You'll find going down or up, like if you don't set that correctly, you get real blurry nasty textures um but this is i just like having it in the file so i remember what all the textures used to be and half the time i'm using some of the colors i like to sort of keep my packs not vanilla but i like to reference vanilla enough that everybody knows what they're looking at even if it's got the zigzag twist so i like to keep a reference of whatever the original was to see if i feel like taking it too far off model or if i'd like to keep it close um, the next step I do is super important. I grab a bunch of reference images. I pop on over to Google, type in Axolotl, see what I get. You'll get much fresher ideas this way if you're looking at the real animal and interpreting it from that. If you're just interpreting it from Minecraft, they've already made that interpretation. They've already looked at the reference done the concept art, made the interpretation. So I just feel like you're not going to get as fresh a take if you just go off of that. So I like to collect a lot of different images. I am blurring out the ref because I don't have the rights to those images in a video. Um, but the things to look for is just different angles, different colors, patterns, textures. If it's something that makes me laugh, uh, I've got some pretty stupid axolotl expressions that I, I just loaded up. Uh, sometimes I'll even reference my own pack. Like I'll just type it into Google and see what the updates I've given before just to see what some of my entities look like as a vibe i'm like okay are they all pretty you know are the smaller creatures all have dots for eyes and the bigger creatures have like the more googly eyes so i'll try to reference my own pack where i can just so i'm keeping things consistent with the other stuff i've already done i also like to visit the minecraft wikis uh, and read about the entity or the block i'm going to work on i check like the behaviors i see how the textures are used Oftentimes when you're making a texture pack or a resource pack, you don't get to play a lot of Minecraft. Uh, it's like a sad, <laughs> a sad thing that most of your time is spent actually making the textures. So you don't get as much time to really get in the game and see how things work. So I find it helpful to go check and see how things work. I'll even go look up like the latest YouTube videos of like people playing um, whatever just came out. So I can kind of keep up to date just listening to other people get to play it. Um, I especially like to check the wiki if I'm working on a crafted item because you can incorporate their ingredients in as like uh, part of the look of it. Like if it takes two different things, I like to have the final look look like it took those two things just so it feels more satisfying to craft. Wee! Wee! Let's go! Yay! Yay! So, with your brain meat full of fresh ideas and info and a second monitor stuffed with ref, you can now start on the real texturing. Zigzag style guide time! Disclaimer, this is just a bunch of rules I made for myself. It's not right or wrong, it is just a series of constraints that gives zigzag consistency. If you make your own rules, you'll find your own style that way. So I could have made a smooth, glossy texture that's pretty realistic and have consistent soft shading, but no! That's not zigzag. Um, zigzag is made with big textured brushes used inside of selections. So the selection tool holds the edge so that it's nice and clean, but the insides are painterly. So for a sphere, I leave a certain amount of chunkiness to it, and I make sure to keep the brush big. Uh, I basically use the biggest brush I can get away with. And I have a rad set of brushes that I sort of collected over the years, different projects at work, at home, and they make big messy textures and also they blend well with pen pressure so I like to use ones that are sort of messy and kind of overlap each other as I press harder or softer. 
Um, and that way I can get a painterly look pretty easily, pretty fast, without having to kind of go in and use the selection over and over and over again. The selection tool uh, features very heavily since, as I said, it's like the only way to get a clean edge with such a big brush. I've had some people try to help me on zigzag and when they get in there to actually try to replicate the style, you're not sure how that brush is making that style because it's so big you can't like draw a line with it. It's just for filling. The other basic zigzag rule is that I use a lot of angles. Uh, I like to have a lot of non-parallel lines. That's sort of where the name of the pack comes from. Everything zigzags. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I will make a selection on a tilt uh, for things like stones or bricks. Like, you'll see this shape a lot, this sort of square with like an inset off-kilter uh, bevel to it. Getting down to business, I got my reference as well as a layer of the original texture below it. I start to draw with the selection tool. So I'll pick a selection, in this case I started with the frills, and I'll sort of fill in the colors. Um, I'm actually just dropping it, just straight eye dropping it, and then doing a little bit of tweakage from the original. I like the color of this axolotl, and I'm going to use it. Uh, I just kind of tweak it, the saturations a bit. Um, I'll use the lock transparency button on the layer. I use that one a lot too, so it's all selection tool, and then once I've got my selection and I've filled it once, I'll lock the transparency and do the shading that way, so I don't have to keep selecting it over and over again. I'll use the layer itself as a selection. Um, and that's kind of how I find the forms I like with the shading. Once it's locked, I can just kind of get in there and pick the highlights out and the shadows. Uh, this is a good time to also mention I use a brush stabilizer called Lazy Nozomi Pro. I think I mentioned it at the beginning of the video, but it's a great way to get smooth selections even when your hand isn't as steady. Uh, a long time ago, I was having an error with my version of Photoshop and my version of my Cintiq where I was getting like this stepped kind of... It was like a, um, a shoelace effect on every line I was doing. It would like end in this little jitter. And the only thing that fixed it was Lazy Nozomi Pro. So I'm, I will shill this product to the end of my days. It's, uh, it's great just for, as like rulers and guides. And it's a, a totally useful tool for Photoshop. It's awesome. And um, the dev is really awesome. They update a lot and there's tons of new features every time. I'll pop a link in the description for that as well. You'll see a lot I'm using the guides to snap when I need to select areas to fill or delete. This is where those guides come in handy on an HD pack. Um, you can see I'm using it to define the edges I want and then just filling in like big chunks of color. Um, or I'll use it to delete a section. So if, I, if something's going over an edge into another box, I can just snap a little selection to it and delete uh, where it's going over. Uh, one thing I'm always constantly doing is checking 3D to 2D, so I'll bring it between Photoshop and Blockbench. It's easy if you keep naming it the same thing, it'll keep reloading in. I'll save out a new PNG, check the edits in 3D to see what's working or what's not. Here you can see that I decided the bottom frilly gilly looks weird, because the way it's connected, it's kind of coming off the bottom. It's not really like matching up with the face. So I do a trick here where I pick a color in Blockbench that's just like completely different from what I'm working on and just use it as a guide. Draw it in 3D so I can see where it actually hits the head. That's hard to visualize in Photoshop for me so I like to do this kind of stuff in Blockbench where I'll just kind of make myself a guide and then that way I can go back into Photoshop with my nice smooth brush and just follow that guide. It's pretty rough. It usually always lines up pretty well. Um, I decided it would look better in this case angled down. Um, some of the reference that I was looking at kind of had um, they kind of stick out in all different directions, so I wanted to have that one angled differently. It's also at this point I realized I wanted each axolotl to have its own gill arrangement because I'm a glutton for pain. <laughs> and if they're going to have different gills, why not just have different faces, right? <laughs> I, again, I just, I couldn't, I can't justify doing like five different guys if they're all going to look like a color tint of the other one so I'm gonna do five different expressions uh, we'll just do one in this video but um, and I opted to do this one with like little cute closed eyes you can see I'm using the guys to select the heads uh, just the head area shade under the cheeks and around the face um, I'll add highlights to just get some depth but again like the biggest brush and I'm not allowed to do any smooth surface shading like there has to be a little bit of chunkiness
And when I checked that in Blockbench, I realized it would look cuter if the face was lower, so I nudge it down a little bit and rework the lashes a little bit. I like the way they're going over that edge of the front. Um, they do that in the original texture too, and I kind of like that look, but it's just like there was too much with the lashes going up, so I simplified it. And now look at the widow baby. Oh. I'm gonna blast through the painting part a little bit because the technique basically remains the same from here. Um, I will add some notes. There's one trick that I like to do, which is to set these stitch marks in 3D so that I know what lines up where. Um, for example, I want the torso to all be painted together. So I assemble it. I basically go into block bench and set up these little stitch guides so I know where everything actually stitches together, export that back into Photoshop, and then once I know where it aligns, I copy paste it together into one chunk and then I work on it, paint on it all in one piece. And that way when I split it back up, I know everything's gonna line up perfectly. I did the same trick for the tail element. I made those little stitchy marks in um, in block bench just to see where that lined up. You can see like all I have to do is copy and paste it to the side. You'll notice that at first I fudged up that top frill line. I didn't make it thick enough so it didn't line up to the top of the back. So I sort of thickened that up and uh, I work on it all in one piece. So that way the tail is just one smooth uh, curved line and then I just kind of cap it. Um, that way I just know it's going to line up. That's why I use that weird little stitch. Just It's another product of me not being the original one that unwrapped it. So I have to sort of reverse how they had put it together initially. Um, I took advantage of this being an HD pack and I added a little cut in the detail to get some waviness at the top of that frill along the back. Um, that's something that like in... It doesn't translate as well in a lower pack. So, you know, I try to add those little HD details because I know it'll look good. Um, for the little dangly legs, I kept them pretty simple. Uh, the idea is that maybe per axolotl, the pose might change a little bit on the variants. Uh, I deleted the there's like a mirror inside of those legs. Uh, it just looks weird in HD. I think it's fine when it's just like a straight like four pixel leg. But as soon as you start getting those bendy fingers and stuff, it just, it just creates some nastiness. So I kept it clean. I just made it one. So it's just the outside, but they, they double face anyway. I wanted to make the gills seem like they were more attached to the head. Um, so in block bench, I painted like a connection point that matched the colors of the gills uh, with the head. So you see those little orange circles. I'm kind of painting them in 3D because now I know exactly where the intersection points are on the 3D model. And then I can refine those circles in Photoshop now that I know exactly where they touch. And that just kind of blends that 2D plane into the 3D cube of the head. I also added additional shading to give the gills like more of a 3D look as they come out of the face itself, which I think is something I wouldn't have thought to do without the reference images. Um, that's like a great case for always be, always be referencing, uh, because you'll find things you wouldn't have thought of out of your imagination. Um, imagination goes a long way, but references take you the rest. The final step is basically I just filled in the bum in the back and shaded under the face. And just to cap it off, there's a little before and a little after, and you've got yourself a cute little friend. And I might make another video if people want to see a time lapse of the other designs. I was planning on doing the other variants next, and I'm thinking like different frills, different faces, and different little dangly legs. So hit me up in the comments if that kind of interests you as a video. I might just do it on one of my streams or I post the images later. But if people want to see sort of how those got painted out, I could do that as well. And if people want more tutorial videos, just shout out suggestions for what you'd like to learn. Um, thinking tiling textures might be a good one to do next if it interests people. So that's it for now, folks. And I'm going to be chipping away at cliffs and caves and hopefully have an update for the pack itself soon. And thanks for watching. Put it in my eye. Don't put it in your eye. I'm doing a little thing in a little paint in my eye. I'm a little La 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 la. La 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 la
a microphone too. So you can do it. A microphone. I'll turn it up a little bit. Axolotl.